Our first, uh, our gospel reading today comes from uh, the uh, gospel according to Matthew chapter 18. Jesus said, Take care that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you, in heaven their angels continually see the face of my Father in heaven. So what do you think? If a shepherd has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it truly, I tell you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones should be lost. If another member of the church sins against you, Go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. Here ends our reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. The, the sermon that I'm going to preach today might sound uh, a bit familiar to you. I hope it does. Uh, this is a theme that we have touched on before, uh, and we're touching on it again. That's not an accident. This is a message that we need to hear again and again, because sometimes we drift away. It's a message that we need to draw from uh, the words of Christ, the experience of the ancient Christian tradition, and remind ourselves again and again, and restate and, 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 and realign our practice, because sometimes we can kind of drift away. We, we hear the message, we understand the message, we practice the message, and then we kind of drift away, so we return to Jesus' advice. Any good sports coach will tell you, you got to keep returning to the fundamentals, right? And keep repeating and learning those fundamentals again, lest we drift away off track from the gospel message from Jesus and into dysfunctional patterns of behaving in our families and our relationships, even in our church. Matthew chapter 18 ends with uh, a, a bit of a math conundrum when uh, Peter asks Jesus so how often do I have to forgive as many as seven times Peter thought he was being very generous in that because the rabbis the teachers at that time said you have to forgive as many as three times so Peter thought let's be really excessive here we'll double that and toss in another one so as many as seven times and Jesus uh, said as many as 77 times. That's the way it reads in our translation. We usually read from the NRSV translation. But there are other translations like the King James translation or the God's Word translation that uh, don't say 77 times. It says 70 times 7. Now, we'll leave it to the Greek scholars to 
argue, uh, you know, what the, the exact meaning of that Greek text. We're not going to get into the minutia about that. One says 77 times, another one says 70 times 7. Uh, I, can you just imagine somebody like keeping track of this and tallying and saying, look, I've already forgiven you uh, a total of 76 times. So uh, if, if, if we're using the NRSV translation or the NIV translation, I only have to forgive you one more time and then we're through. <laughs> However, if you are using the King James translation, then I, I still need to forgive you uh, 414 times. So I would advise you to either <laughs> change your behavior or change your Bible translation. <laughs> uh, obviously, we're not getting into that, all right? That's not Jesus' point, regardless of how you want to do the math or translate the Greek. Remember when we did our study series on uh, Revelation last spring? Numbers in the Bible have a symbolic meaning. Seven represents perfection. Ten represents completion. So Jesus is saying, how often do you have to forgive? You have to forgive completely, perfectly, without limits. I want us in this sermon today to keep it real. And to do that, keep in mind some of the people that you most need to forgive right now. And I want you to take a moment to call those people to mind. You don't have to point at each other. <laughs> um, and you don't have to write it down unless you want somebody to see. <clears throat> uh, I just want you to see whose name I'm writing down here. Um, it might be some lingering resentment that you've carried for months. It might be a deep wound that you've borne for years. It might be some sharp words that you had this morning as you were getting ready to come to church. It might be your pastor. <laughs> but, but, but I want you to keep those people in mind as we go through the sermon today, as we study this text, so that we stay rooted in reality. Jesus begins in Matthew chapter 18 with step one of a four-step plan for conflict resolution. A four-step plan for resolving conflicts kind of sounds like some trendy self-help book that you'd listen to on audible.com. Uh, it, it, but, but Jesus' words are as relevant today as they were when he first spoke them to his disciples, uh, as, as real and as necessary today as they were in the times of the early church. So let's take a look at how Jesus tells us to resolve conflict. Step one, verse 15. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. Right off the bat, Jesus shows his great insight into human nature because he says, if another member of the church sins against you, he doesn't say, if you sin against another member of the church, because then we'd come back and say, I didn't do anything wrong. They're the ones that messed up. They're the ones that need to apologize to me. Uh, Jesus is like, whatever. That's cool. Uh, so let's say, they're the ones who sinned against you. What do you do? Go and talk to them. Go. Talk. To them. I don't know of any research that has shown this, but my hunch is I'd say about 95% of the conflicts that we experience could be taken care of pretty quickly if we would just follow that first step that Jesus gives us in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. The conflicts that we experience, if we would just sit down and have an honest, heart-to-heart, -heart, real conversation about those, I, I think they could be resolved. It, it, it sounds something like this. Let's, I, wanted to, I, I had to come up with a name that nobody in the congregation has, as far as I know. So let's say Ralph sinned against me. So I say, Ralph, 
I just haven't felt right about what happened last week, about what you said, or what you did. And I felt, honestly, I felt kind of hurt by that. But your friendship matters to me. Our relationship is important to me. Um, but man, what happened just has been bugging me and I haven't felt right about it. So I, I wanted to talk with you about it. Um, that we might come to a better understanding of each other. That's kind of how it goes. Now some might say, oh man, it takes a lot of courage to go have that conversation with somebody face to face. I don't think it takes any courage unless Ralph has a criminal violent history or <laughs> a history of vindictive behavior. Uh, but I do think it takes a lot of integrity to say directly what you would say to others behind his back. I think it takes honesty. Um, that's what it takes. Usually, though, we, do, we just want to jump over that first step that Jesus gives us, right? Uh, we'll turn our backs on them. So I'm not talking to you. We'll pout and we'll stew and we'll talk to other people. Uh, gossip, go around and around on that. Uh, or, or, or maybe uh, confront them in a public setting so it humiliates them. Jesus doesn't do those kind of behaviors. It doesn't encourage us to, to, to do any of that. Rather, he says, go talk about what's on your mind. If someone hurts you, sins against you, talk to them honestly, clearly, directly, one-on-one. -on -one. This is not the time to escalate the argument by saying things like, you are so stupid, you are a great big dummy head. <laughs> uh, accusations, attacks like that are not going to get us anywhere. Uh, rather, the person is just going to get more defensive. Instead, you place your wounded heart with trust in their hands and, and say, this is how I felt. And in that scenario, they're much less likely to get defensive and try to attack and much more likely to try to work toward a reconciliation. But I think that the major obstacle that keeps us from doing this simple first step, and don't worry, I'm not going to spend this much time on all of the steps. Some of them we can move along with pretty quickly, uh, is the belief that it couldn't be that simple. It's, I know, that's in the Bible, but that would never work. And let me tell you, I've seen it work so many times in life-changing ways. And I, I'd like to give you an example of that. Glenn Mitchell lived in Jacksonville, Florida. His son was murdered. Obviously an extraordinarily painful, tragic experience. But rather than uh, giving in to bitterness, he made a choice. And that choice was to go and talk to uh, one of the people who participated in that murder. His name was Ellis Curry. And they met. They sat down and they talked. Just the two of them. They spoke clearly and honestly, heart to heart, one on one. And Glenn talked about his son. He talked about how much his death pained him still. He shared pictures of his son. And he said that he honestly did not know what was going to come next. He just knew that he had to do this. Ellis Curry said that he was sorry. And he apologized. And, and he served his time in prison. And after he had finished that time and he was released, then Mitchell invited him to go with him one night to a meeting of Jacksonville City Council as they were talking about how to reduce crime in their area. And the two of them spoke about their experience. After that, they started to travel together with a message of healing, reconciling, 
the, the ability to talk to one another and ask for forgiveness and to give forgiveness and how that can be transformative. They, they, they to this day, go around to schools and, and they talk to young people who are at risk of joining gangs. They are changing lives. Now, it seemed preposterous at first to live this gospel. And I think sometimes it can seem preposterous to us. Oh, sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation and talk honestly about, about, about how I feel. He took a risk and he did that. He made a choice to live out the Beatitudes, to be merciful, to be pure of heart, to be a peacemaker. And along the way, he healed the heart of a criminal. He healed um, his own heart. And he touched the lives of countless other people. Now, it's not easy. I'm not going to pretend that that's easy. But I will tell you this, it is a whole lot easier than carrying around all that pain and all that hurt, than carrying around a grudge or seeking revenge for, for, for all those years, that anger, that resentment that so many people carry around with them in a world that believes in an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth or retaliation or revenge. Jesus' second step comes to us in verse 16 when Jesus says that if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So, so what happens when you try this first approach? You say, okay, I'm going to take this risk. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to have an honest conversation. Uh, and it doesn't work. You might need some help from others. You might need some backup. You might need some guidance. Um, uh, in some situations, counselors can fulfill this role. A parent, a trusted friend, a pastor. Um, and then Jesus says in step three, verse 17, if the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. The Greek word that is used there is ekklesia, which means literally the community. Uh, so you seek the guidance and the support of the faith community. Talk to your pastor. Talk to the church moderator. If the conflict happens to be with the pastor, go to the pastoral relations committee, the PRC, and talk with them about it. How is this different from the, the step of the two or three witnesses? I, I think the difference is seen in verse 20 where Jesus says, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there am I present with them. In other words, when we gather in Jesus' name, two or three, it's different because Jesus himself is with us. If you can imagine sitting down at the table, with the person with whom you had a conflict for a cup of coffee and Jesus is also there at the table. I think Jesus would like coffee, don't you? I think Jesus would drink, uh, would not drink decaf. He's probably drinking really caffeinated. He's having an espresso, right? <laughs> but, but, but if Jesus could join you in that conversation and participate in that conversation, invite Jesus to be present. And that's what we do when two or three are gathered in Jesus' name. When the ecclesia, the community, trusts in his guidance and his presence. Finally, step four is in verse 18. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. Now that at first might seem like an invitation to just turn your back on somebody. Say, okay, we're done. Shut down the relationship. Until we remember this. How did Jesus treat Gentiles? How did Jesus treat tax collectors? Nobody knew this better than the guy who wrote these words down, Matthew. Do you remember what Matthew's job was? Tax uh, thank you. All right. Some of you have studied the Bible. Good job. <laughs> Matthew was a tax collector when Jesus called him to be a disciple, and he left that table behind 
that he might walk the path of Jesus. Nobody knew better than Matthew himself how Jesus treated tax collectors. And so he wrote down throughout this book of Matthew, like in chapter 9, he says that when they saw that Jesus was eating with tax collectors and sinners, they criticized Jesus. Or in Matthew chapter 8, that Jesus went to a pagan, a Roman centurion, someone who participated in the, the Roman religion at that time, and he healed the, the servant of this Roman centurion. On the cross, Jesus uh, addressed the soldiers, the Roman soldiers who had crucified him and said, Father, forgive them. And he spoke to the repentant thief and said, Today you will be with me in paradise. How did Jesus treat tax collectors and sinners? He, he relentlessly showed them so much love. He healed them. He, he, he forgave them. He loved them. He reached out to them. There are some wounds that only that kind of unconditional love that the Greek word is agape, that God-like love that doesn't have limits. It doesn't come to an end. These first three steps can take us to a certain point, but they can only take us so far. Grace takes us the rest of the way. Forgiveness that you have in your heart takes us the rest of the way. Last year we did a Lenten study series that was based on this book by Desmond Tutu and Umfo Tutu called The Book of Forgiving. Uh, and, and, and we talked about how that grace, that wonderful healing, forgiving love of Jesus takes us the rest of the way. And this is where Christianity becomes a very distinct way of living. Agape love, God's love, that unconditional selfless God-like love. Look, there will be times when the message is not received. There will be conflicts that don't get better. There will be times that we disagree with one another. Does that come as a surprise to anybody? <laughs> uh, there will be times when we disagree with one another. I'm like, okay, I can live with that. And there will be times when we are hurt badly by those around us. And I'm sorry to hear that. There may even be times when to, to be safe, we need to separate ourselves from certain relationships. But there is nothing that I see in the scriptures that ever gives us the authority to veto these words of Jesus in John chapter 13. This is my commandment that you love one another. There will be legitimate differences in our family relationships, in our friendships, and in our church community. But this, uh, this is Jesus' commandment, that we love one another, that we walk this path of the gospel. This is not just pious dribble, brothers and sisters. This is real. This is powerful. This is practical. This is hard, but it, it is doable. Most of you know uh, if you've been here for a while, and I've told this story before, I'm not going to repeat, tell much, repeat it again today, that, that I sat down and met with the man who shot and killed my brother, Russ. Uh, I know that this is real. I know that this can be done. Uh, and, and you've heard me talk about ways that in El Salvador we took members of the MS-13 gang and other gangs who were killing one another and they were reconciled with one another. I have seen the power uh, and transformation that happens when people follow these steps. And I believe that this is an important message that we need now more than ever before. So let's go back to the beginning. Let's remember those names that I asked you to call to mind. Who are those people whom you most need to forgive right now? I want you to think about them. I want you to remember them. I want you to call them to mind right now in prayer. Jesus' ministry to us was a ministry of reconciliation. And so too must our ministry to one another be a ministry of reconciliation. Please join me now in prayer. Heavenly Father, you have given us life. We ask you now to heal the wounds that divide us one from another. Teach us to forgive. 
Help us to share in your ministry of reconciliation. Lord Jesus, as you have loved and forgiven us, teach us to love and forgive one another, for we are all your children. And it is not your will that a single one of us be lost. In Jesus we pray. Amen.